Our scripture today comes from the Sermon on the Mount, which we're going to be studying throughout now and uh, through the end of May. We're going to pick it up at the very beginning, Matthew chapter 5. This is the word of the Lord. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down and his disciples came to him. And he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of goodness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And you, all of you, are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. The word of God. Well, I love these passages. Uh, as I shared with you last week, uh, when I first gave my heart over to Christ, or actually when Christ grabbed my heart, was actually more like what happened. I was 17 years old and sitting alone in my house, uh, uh, depressed like most 17-year-olds are. And, uh, and I picked up a Bible and I began to just read through it. And I have no idea exactly what I read, but my life and heart was just flooded with love. And it really changed. That was uh, however many years ago, a heck of a lot of years ago. And I picked up the New Testament. Uh, I'm kind of glad I didn't pick up the whole Bible. Because the Old Testament's a little rough. But I picked up the New Testament in modern English, the J.B. Phillips translation. And in four short chapters, I got to the part I just read to you. And so this is one of the first things I ever read. And I remember my heart was gripped. I didn't understand at least two-thirds of it. But I got to a verse that we're going to look at a few weeks from now where where Jesus says, set your heart on God's kingdom and God's kind of goodness, and all the rest of the stuff you're worried about will come to you as a matter of course. And I remember it was a, an aha moment for a little 17-year-old guy, and I thought, well, this is Jesus. I mean, I was raised to respect Jesus, and he says, I'm supposed to be seeking first the kingdom, is the translation you're probably used to, and all the rest will take care of itself. And I remember just thinking, that's either true or it's not true. And I thought, I guess I'll give it a shot. And so I bumbled along with many more failings than successes, but trying to seek first the kingdom of God and his kind of goodness, which is how I would translate righteousness, God's kind of goodness. And I found that lo and behold, it's true that if we set our hearts in the right place, other things have a way of working out. The problem is we don't have an accurate view of ourselves, and we don't have an accurate view of God, and we don't tend to have an accurate view of other people. And that's why Jesus starts this entire inaugural address of his 
with the statement, blessed are those who know their spiritual poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, when we read it in the poetic language, it sounds nice, but we're not sure what it means. What is poor in spirit? And we looked at that last week. I told you we were going to spend two weeks on this one verse. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Why, when I've got all these chapters to get through, would I spend two whole sessions on this one? Because unless we understand it, it's like, it's like coming to a beautiful house and there's a banquet inside. But if you don't know where the front door is, you may not get into the banquet. The front door of the house of all that is good is described in this passage. Blessed are those who are acquainted with their own spiritual need, neediness, brokenness, frailty, lostness. Blessed are those who know their spiritual poverty. As you've heard me say many times, I, I love the 12-step program. It's a spiritual program. Frankly, I think we ought to just all go through the 12 steps, whether alcohol or drug addiction is, or uh, uh, any kind of codependency is a part of your life, because those 12 steps take you into this question. How do we come to grips with our own spiritual, not success, but brokenness? The fourth step in that program says something like this. Let's do a, a fearless moral inventory of our life. Don't try that at home. You know, it's for professionals. No, I'm just kidding. You should try it. It is the step that takes you into a much deeper walk with Christ. Meister Eckhart, a great mystic, Christian mystic from the Middle Ages, said, there are many people who will follow our Lord the first half, but very few who will follow him the second half, because the second half means giving up your life. He didn't mean your physical life. Well, he meant that ultimately, but giving up your own life. We're going to look at these two concepts, humility and surrender. And they're, they're, without them, the spiritual life uh, is really running on two cylinders. It's pretty much, as C.S. Lewis said, if you don't have these down, uh, your, your religion, your spiritual life is pretty much like paint. You know, you paint it over the surface, but it doesn't sink down in. And it's meant to be not like paint, it's meant to be like a dye that sinks down into the pores of your life. Humility, what is it? Humility is knowing yourself the way God knows you. Now, that doesn't mean you should cower under it. Oh, my word, I can't possibly, I'd be so horror-stricken. No, actually, when God thinks of you, God is thinking of the you that God created and that God intended. Now, he sees the you that lives right now with your strengths and your weaknesses, with your talents and your flaws, with your brokenness and your joys. He sees it all and loves you as you are. Not, not as you should be, as you are. He loves you right now. There's no question about it. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He didn't give his only begotten son so that he could love the world. He loves you right now. You can't make him love you more than you, can, than you are loved right now in that pew or that seat out there or sitting at home watching this on uh, the internet. I wonder if Jesus ever had to say things like that, you know, watching us on the internet. <laughs> You're loved completely, unconditionally, 100% right now with your strengths and your weaknesses. The trouble is, you may tend to see yourself in a way that is not accurate. So if you were going to surrender your life to God, you actually uh, wouldn't know what you were doing. You, you'd, you'd have the wrong picture of yourself. That's why a fearless moral inventory in AA, or what we attempt to do symbolically with a prayer of confession, what I did uh, with my spiritual director one time was what called a general confession, where I tried to bring my whole self, the good and the bad, before God and release it. You see, you need to know your own need. Mother Teresa, I mentioned last week in the sermon, uh, 
she had a wonderful statement about this humility. She said this, if I can find it. She said, even almighty God cannot fill what is already full. Even God can't fill you if you're already full of yourself. You're meant to empty that part of yourself so that God can fill you. And what is that part of yourself? That part of yourself is what Thomas Merton called the false self, uh, what I might call a projected self or a limited self or a small self or an unredeemed ego. It's that you that you would like to think, but if you ask your family members, they might not recognize it because they see all of you or, or bigger portions of you. And we're meant to bring all of ourselves to God. Self-knowledge, Mother Teresa went on to say, self-knowledge leads us to our knees. If you want to know humility, you, you just get to know yourself as you really are, and you become acquainted with your own spiritual poverty. It's as uh, James Martin uh, in the book, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, <laughs> kind of a great title, he says this, spiritual poverty is a radical understanding of our deep dependence on God. So when we get to know ourselves, there are moments of clarity that we have when we realize we don't have it all together, and yet we don't go into shame, we don't go into guilt, we don't go into self-destructive patterns. We just see ourselves for who we are, the weakness and the strength, and we realize we're radically dependent on God. We're actually radically dependent on one another as well. We tend to think we're only dependent on ourselves. And as Americans, most of us are Americans here, if not all, uh, we've been raised to think Independence Day. You know, that's what we call the 4th of July. We, we are an independent nation. We believe in independence. We don't want to be dependent. We don't even want to be interdependent. We want to be able to stand on our own two feet, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Have you ever tried that, by the way? You don't get very far off the ground, really. And, and all of that has a really good side, a really good side. Self-reliance, responsibility, all kinds of good things. But ultimately, it's not true. For example, what did you do today to create the oxygen you're breathing right now? Nothing, right? Oh, what did you do uh, to get yourself born on planet Earth? Didn't have any say in it. You were just, what did you do to be born in this country if you were? Mm. You could have been born in Saudi Arabia or the Ukraine or Russia or China or Japan. Which, interesting, just a little aside, that should give us a lot of grace toward people of other cultures that maybe we don't even like. Because you could have been one of them. You just happened to be born here. So this, this idea that we bring ourselves to God, who is the self we're bringing to God? It's meant to be our whole self. And there's part of that self that, honestly, this is going to sound really harsh, there's part of that self that God simply wants to kill. It's, it's your false self. It's what Paul calls the old man or the old woman in you. The one that's living an old life, not an elderly life, but a life apart from God, seeking to live apart from the love and the power of Christ. And so when we come to our, the end of ourselves, which all of us have done at one time or another, we have a complete change of identity. Now, now Jesus was our pioneer. He, he's the one who went before us. And I believe you see this exact change in his life, even though his was without a false self. His didn't have a, a, a self that was uh, uh, broken or out of harmony with God's love, which is another way of saying his life was sinless. You remember what happened? He, he went to see John the Baptist, who was probably his cousin. 
and John was baptizing people, which wasn't a normal thing in their culture. Nobody got baptized. There was no such thing. The closest thing that, that the Jewish people had at that time was a ceremonial hand washing before, before a non-Jew could become a Jew, a sort of a sense of cleansing. But John the Baptist went out to this river and started baptizing all the people who were already Jewish. So it, it made no sense. And he wasn't just having them wash their hands. He was plunging. The Baptist got this right. I hate to admit it. He would put them all the way under the water. Not a little sprinkle on the head. The word baptism actually is a Greek word. And we just transliterated it to English. It means immersion. Dunking, soaking. So Jesus comes to this water for baptism, immersion, looks like he's dying going under the water and coming up fresh and new. That's what the symbol of baptism is meant to be. Dying to the old self, rising to the true self. Now in Jesus' case, as I mentioned, there was no sin to be forgiven, but there was an identity to be made secure. And so when he came up out of that water, we're told in three of the four Gospels, a voice from heaven said, you are my beloved son, and I'm so pleased with you. That was his identity from then on. As Dallas Willard put it, the heavens were split open, and, and the Holy Spirit came down like a dove, and the voice came out and said, you are my beloved son. The, the heavens were open for Jesus, and he never lived another minute without the heavens opened. Wouldn't that be wonderful? To have reality open all around you and live in it and not in the delusional self that we have. If I have enough money, I'll be okay. If I don't get sick, I'll be fine. You know, and all these things we try to pace together to keep our little fragile self independent when it's meant to be radically dependent on God, which brings love, by the way, and interdependent on others, which brings fellowship. So we're meant to live with the heavens open. We're meant to live with a new identity. And the new identity is you are a daughter of God. You are a son of God, and you're not only that, God is pleased with you. As you said right there, Hope, God is pleased with you. Joyce, you're God's beloved daughter, and he's so pleased. Don, you're Brian. Sherry, you are God's daughter, and he's so pleased. That's the identity you live in. What was the identity Jesus had lived in to some extent before that? Well, he was Joseph's son, they said. He was Mary's son. He had some brothers and sisters. He was a carpenter. Well, those were true things about him, but it was not his central identity. And our central identity has to be the same as his, radically dependent daughters and sons living with the heavens open. I want to use a couple analogies from uh, C.S. Lewis. As I mentioned last week, it, it's kind of fun to do this sort of final series for me because I get to pull out some of my favorite things that you've heard before. But I, uh, for me, they're just, they're just so powerful, even after all this time. In the very tail end of this book, Mere Christianity, which I read right after... Uh, I came to a faith in Christ and started reading the New Testament. By the way, as a 17-year-old, I read the whole New Testament in about, I don't know, maybe a month. And, you know, people are shocked. Oh, my word, you read the whole... We read books all the time. You read mystery novels all the time. They're as long as the New Testament. Someday, just pick up the New Testament and forget that it's a holy book. Just read it like a book. It's not that big a deal, except that it'll change your life. The mystery novel, probably not. But they are kind of fun, I, I admit. So C.S. Lewis, I read this book, and I'm telling you, the last portion of it is so profound. The whole thing is, bogs down a little in the middle, but the, the last portion of it is absolutely tremendous. He makes these analogies. He says, we're a little bit, I'm going to paraphrase some of these and read some of those. He says, we're a little bit like a person 
who's a responsible, upright person, and, and we'll pay our taxes, and we really will, and we won't cheat, we'll actually pay our taxes, but when we're done paying our taxes, we want to have enough left over to get on with our life and do what in the world we want to do with it, right? That's a little bit how we are with God. We go the first half, but not the second. Oh, Lord, I'll pay, I'll pay some tax, okay? We'll go to church. I might even read the New Testament like Bart suggested. Well, how about half of it, maybe, or, or maybe just a couple pages? And, and I'll give some money to the Ukraine, which I hope you all do, give it to Direct Relief or some of the other things that are mentioned on our website. I'll give some money to the poor. Uh, I'll do this, I'll do that. I'll pay my taxes, and then I want to get on and live my life the way I want to live it. That's how we tend to think even spiritually. But Lewis says this, the Christian way is different. It's harder, and yet it's easier. Christ says, quote, give me all. Now, I don't want this much of your time or so much of your money or that much of your work. I want you. I've not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and there. I want to have the whole tree down. I don't want to drill the tooth or, or put a crown on it. I want to have it out. Hand over the whole natural self. All the desires you think are so innocent, as well as the ones that you think are so wicked, hand over the whole outfit and I'll give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. You see, what a beautiful, what a beautiful image. It, no half measures will do, he says in another place. You gotta hand over the whole outfit. In another place, he says, you gotta give God brains and all. You know, it's not just your heart. You gotta give him your mind too, and your strength, and your soul. Everything. In another place, he says, if, 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 you, if you're like a field and you want some wheat, but there's only some other kind of plant sown in there, it's not good enough to just throw a little wheat seed in there because it'll get choked out. You've got to be plowed up, turned over, and re-sown. In another place, he said, we're like a living house. Uh, we're, we're, we're a house that's, you know, some of the drains aren't working that well, and, you know, there's a few walls that are lopsided, and this and that is a little broken, and, oh, and our life is like that. It's got some, it's kind of, still kind of a nice little cottage, and we want to give it to God, right? And so, so someday we give it to God, and then all of a sudden the carpenters show up, and they got architectural plans, and they start tearing down walls and taking off the roof and throwing out a wing over here and a new chimney over there. And we're going, wait a minute, I, I gave my life, my, my little house, my little cottage to God so he could tidy it up a bit. I didn't think he was going to tear it down and rebuild it. Yet that's what God wants to do with our lives. And the spiritual life is a series of deepening surrenders. I want to say that again. The spiritual life or the life in Christ, your life in Christ, is a series of deepening surrenders. Not clinging, not trusting in your own goodness, not trying to build a, a little religious life. It's a surrendered life, 100%. The trouble is none of us quite get to that 100%. And so it's a series, okay, I'll give you five more percent, and then we take three back. You know, and then we give them 10%. So now we're up to seven, but then we take two back, so we're back to five. I mean, it's a series of three steps forward, two steps back. Sometimes three steps forward, five steps back. It's a journey, but the end goal is that we become new creatures. Another analogy he uses that I love, he says, it's a little bit, it's, it's, it's not like training a horse to be really good at jumping the barriers. That's, that's kind of the way we think of our spiritual lives. Okay, I'm going to really get trained. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And, I, and I'll be a better kind of person. You know, my, but we're starting with the person we are. And we're just going to kind of tidy it up a bit. Make it jump a little higher. 
And so we start jumping over fences. We get over this one. We get over. We're kind of up to like three or four feet fences. We're feeling pretty good about it. And Lewis says, actually, it's not like that. It's not like a horse jumping a little higher. It's like a horse that sprouts wings. And the trouble is, if you saw a horse that was sprouting wings and becoming a winged creature, at the very beginning when you saw the wings coming out of the back, it, it looked kind of awkward. You might even think a little ugly, and it certainly wouldn't help that horse jump in the beginning. In some of our spiritual lives, the wings are just beginning to form. And so this series of deepening surrenders allows those wings to spread out. So we come to know ourselves, poor in spirit, in order to surrender ourselves the whole outfit. To give over the whole house. To be plowed up, to be stained rather than painted. And we allow God to remold our minds from within, which is what Paul says in Romans 12. He said, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold but let God remold your mind from within. So blessed are the poor in spirit, not the rich in spirit. Blessed are those who know they have a radical dependence on God. I'll close with this. What are we surrendering to? We come to know ourselves in order to surrender our small selves, our limited selves, our false selves, to what? Well, to God, for sure. Which means we're surrendering them to love. Which means we're surrendering our lives to an invitation into the home of all that is good. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? Thomas Keating used it. We're surrendering ourselves to an invitation that's come to us from beyond an invitation into the home of all that is good. It's an invitation, ironically, into your own life. God is inviting you to actually live your own life, the life God intended you to live, the life God created you to live, the life you're only living in part right now, a full life, as Jesus called it, an abundant life, your own life the way God envisions it. And when we do that, we ultimately become at home with ourselves. A lot of you, and myself included, we're not at home with ourselves. We're not comfortable with ourselves. You're meant to be. Jesus was a stranger to self-hatred, as, as uh, Brennan Manning pointed out. You're meant to be at home with yourself, and you're meant to be at home with God, trusting your own life completely to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son. I pray that you would lead us into a full knowledge of our own spiritual dependence, into the truth of the proverb that tells us to trust in you with all our hearts and not to trust in our own understanding, but in all our ways, our brokenness, our strengths, in all our ways to acknowledge you and to allow you to guide our paths. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to communion today. What were you going to sing? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I thought I'd missed the cue there. We come to communion today, and this is the table of the Lord. This is the table that's set before you. This is the, the door into the home where this table is set is the door of humility. It's the only door to get in. And Jesus said on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took up the cup afterwards in the same manner. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And so we come to this table not only to remember Jesus, but to surrender to Jesus, to surrender to the Holy Spirit, to surrender to God the Father, to surrender to divine love, to surrender to this invitation into the home of all that is good. God is not inviting you into a truncated life. 
God is not inviting you into a religious life. God is inviting you into your own real life, a life of the most loving version of yourself you can ever imagine. That's what you're being invited into. And anyone may come to this table. This is not for the holy. This is not for the special. This is not for the righteous. This is for those who limp up here, as I mentioned last week. With our brokenness and with our giftedness. The whole outfit. So you're welcome to come. The way we'll take communion today is we'll actually file outdoors and the communion tables are set up out there. And then if you'll just circle back around and come in, we'll sing the Lord's Prayer together to enter, uh, to end our time together. Father, these are, this is the food of your Son and your Spirit offered to these people. The same kind of people that were listening to your Son on that mountain on the north side of the Sea of Galilee who heard him say the good news of the kingdom is that you're blessed when you know your spiritual need. So we confess our spiritual need here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. And I think we're good to hold hands these days. So let's grab hands across the aisle. Sing the Lord's Prayer. Which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be yours now, and may you accept the invitation into the home of all that is good, so that you may become acquainted more deeply with God, more deeply with yourself, more deeply with those around you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen.